Unlike other ancient societies, women in ancient Egypt had a high degree of equal opportunity and freedom. But guys, when you compare a half rotten banana to a fully rotten banana, one is still gonna seem better than the other even though they're both rotten, right? Well, today's Bumblebee video is about the lesser rotten banana. It's the top 10 messed up things that happen to women in ancient Egypt. Number 10 starts us with the blame game because it is super important to note off the bat, yes, because of how progressive ancient Egypt was in comparison to other societies, their grievances against women tend to align themselves with either a power play of socioeconomics or adult activities. Aside from that, property and wealth were passed through women, divorce was accessible and easy, and the concept of virginity didn't exist, so you had a lot of liberty, man or woman. Also, you weren't property as a woman, and that's like winning the ancient world's lottery card. However, one thing they had in major common with the other ancient societies is how quick they were to blame things on women. Oh man, a war started because these two dudes are beefing it out over their dad's throne. Must actually be Cleopatra's fault for being so hot. Because that makes sense, all right. So if the Nile flooded, an angry goddess was to blame. If the pharaoh was killed, his wife had to be involved in the coup. Women were supposed to hold equal standing to men, but unsurprisingly, ancient Egyptian literary texts depict adulterous women as the central figures that disrupt the social order of all of Egypt and thus are deserving of a horrible death for having the audacity taint her husband, nay the world, with her evil doings. Meanwhile, a man or even a pharaoh could be playing the fields harder than a lacrosse team and nobody said boo. In one way, such stories or folktales served as warnings or regulatory mechanisms. In another, they are prime examples of symbolic violence. Women are to be blamed. The blame game is fueled by resentment, the drive of man to be the fastest, strongest, the best, yet they do not have the one truest powers their counterparts hold, a womb. The ability to create and deliver life is something their male gods can do, but the men on earth could not. If the womb wielders have built-in facet of power you can't regulate nor have yourself, chances are you're gonna be pretty mad about it and lash out in some dumb ways. Such is number nine, which is taken and takers, aka how men controlled the narrative. So in a militaristic society such as ancient Egypt, there is a hierarchy depicted in their literature and art, which Egyptian soldiers are dominant over the enemy soldiers that are subordinated. Intercourse similar to the Greeks was about pleasure, but it was also about the rules of taker and taking. Battle was also about taker and taking. Over time, these two began to correlate with the asymmetrical power relation of gender and influence how both battle and gender standards are depicted, i.e. the narratives of women, men, and war are very carefully regulated, framing gender through feminization of enemies to show them as weaklings, the taken, that the pharaoh and his men dominated as the takers. These two different hierarchies ended up legitimizing both, thus the defeat of enemies is as normal and natural as the domination of men over women. On the flip side of feminizing enemies in their murals and reliefs and statues alike, there was the absence of their enemies and even their own women. Well, at least from the New Kingdom era and onwards. Aggressive acts or depictions of slayings of the enemy's women were carefully left out of battle representations even though they were depicted earlier and were still referred to in textual sources. Clearly, local Egyptian male audiences did not find it appropriate to depict deeds against non-combatants on the walls of their temples. Another example of women's removal from history would be queens like Nefertiti, Hapshebut, Aksenamun, and countless other leading ladies that were struck out of the records by angry old men. If you want to learn more about some badass ancient Egyptian chicks and more regal ladies like them, maybe take a second to subscribe to The Hive, because we love a good historical feminist. Number eight is about life expectancy, which is determined by looking at the fractures and wear on bones. Analyses of the physical evidence of trauma on ancient bones, differences in skeletal markers and occupational stress, and of health status actually do indicate lower life expectancy for women than men in ancient Egypt. Now, class plays a huge role. I mean, yeah, a noble woman is definitely going to live longer than a military man foot soldier, but I'm more referring to how a woman who is physically harmed by her husband could just divorce him and walk away. But a noble woman in the same situation had to endure it due to political ties. For example, a study of 271 skeletons from the Old Kingdom cemeteries at Giza, the highest incident of bone fractures occurs in male workers at 43.75%, while bone fractures occurred in 20.73% of male high officials. Bone fractures occurred in 26.41% of female workers, but only 16.66% of the female elite. The life expectancy of women rounds down 30 years and 34 years for men. The most common killer of Egyptian women was the same as most of the ancient world. Men, disease, and of course childbirth. Women often had numerous
numerous children and these successive pregnancies could be fatal. Complications such as perpal, fever, hemorrhaging, or postpartum depression. And speaking of bones, number seven is stick stones and broken bones. A study in 2014 comparing the bones of ancient women with those of modern female athletes has shown the average prehistoric agricultural woman had stronger upper arms than the living Cambridge University female rowing champions who are in their early 20s, train twice a day, and row an average of 120 kilometers a week. The Neolithic women analyzed in the study were from 7,400 years ago to 7,000 years ago, but had similar leg bone strength to modern rowers. Their arm strength though, y'all, these ladies were buff. Their bones were 11 to 16% thicker than in size than that of the rowers and almost 30% stronger. Then there were the Bronze Age ladies from 4,300 years ago to 3,500 years ago who had 9 to 13% stronger arm bones, but their legs were 12% weaker. A possible explanation for these hella arm gains through generations is the tilling of soil and the harvesting of crops by hand, processing milks and meats, fetching water, as well as the grinding of grain for as much as five hours a day to make flour and other things. For millennia, grain would have been ground by hand between two large stones called a saddle quern. The repetitive arm action of grinding these stones together for hours may have loaded women's arms, backbones, in similar ways to the laborers back and forth motion of rowing. Wow, and nowadays we just doom scroll on Instagram for five hours to get buff thumbs. Dr. Jay Stocks, the senior on the study, comments our findings suggest that for thousands of years, the rigorous manual labor of women was a crucial driver of the early farming economies. And speaking of, number six is the harem gals. As we know from Mike Rowe, it's a dirty job, but somebody's gotta do it. The king was considered to be deserving of many women as long as he cared for his great royal wife as well. Everything that touched the person of the pharaoh was meticulously codified and ritualized as a result, starting with his closest family, his wives and their different statuses, main wives, secondary wives, favorites, and then concubines. Being in a royal harem had its ups and its downs. You were property, which is boo, but you were well taken care of, which is yay. The royal harem was installed in part of the royal palace or royal palace complex, as in Thebes or Memphis, Amenhotep III kept his concubines in a palace at Maltaka, which is one of the most opulent in the history of Egypt. Alongside these fixed harems, there were also traveling harems with a crew, so that the pharaoh's companions could follow him more comfortably during his many trips. Moreover, it was an opportunity to siphon different cities that had the honor of hosting them. Ah, uh, smart, smart. You bring a band of hot ladies wherever you go, and you make a buck off of any noble trying to experience the pleasures of a different land. However, unlike the wives and other women the pharaoh pursued, these were the only ladies unable to say no. Their role is to be a temptation, and as a result of being temptations of the harem, the pharaoh could boast an abundant amount of offspring, like Ramesses II, who had no less than 85 children. And unfortunate women, as said, could die from complications or rampantly transmitted diseases. Let's be real, can't tell me crabs wasn't an issue in like 6th century BCE. Might as well segue on over to number five, which is contraceptives and menstruation. So, fun fact, that whole virginity, oh, deflowering, woe is me, that crap didn't happen. Ancient Egyptians didn't even have a word for virgins, it was literally a free for all until you got married. But obviously, you gotta avoid pregnancy somehow, and when Aunt Flo shows up, you gotta find a way to slap her right back out the door. Women who were menstruating would have been considered impure and excused from activities that had the potential to contaminate other family members. What do I mean by contaminate? They're out here acting like a period is transmittable through air. I guess they thought her essence or sweat or something would ruin the vibes of their mojo dojo casa house because ladies were even banned from cooking. Certain sections of temples would also be off limits to women at this time because we can't have them going and menstruating everywhere. Thus the tampon is born. Using a wooden splint with a softened form of papyrus they created a bundle and popped her in. And please tell me you remember the Seinfeld episode about the sponge, a famous contraceptive method from the 70s and 80s that was so well loved by women that when they heard it was being discontinued, they bought out all the pharmacies. Elaine in the episode herself buys the last six cases. But like Elaine and the ladies of the groovier eras, the ancient Egyptians had a similar form of contraceptive. Honey, a chia, and colocynth would be soaked in linen and then placed up in the lady parts, just like how a sponge was. Lactic acid, which is found in a chia is a confirmed man juice aside work with me here people and colocynth is actually still used today in regions of the Middle East for how effective it is as a contraceptive another was intentionally prolonging breastfeeding fun fact for my uterus wielding people out there but lactation prevents pregnancy by inhibiting ovulation on the flip side it's number four how infertility sucks in a society where intercourse outside of marriage wasn't shamed or dirty and virginity didn't even exist it meant marriage actually really was about love settling down and children considered essential for the the continuation of the community. This important requisite resulted in the development of protective deities such as
as Bess and Thoris. There was also an attempt to understand and manage a reproductive process. Medical formula after formula, amulet after amulet, the spiritual petition after petition, they all attested to this concern. For example, experimental marriages existed to help men avoid marrying infertile women. This test period was a year and the experiment ended when a woman became pregnant. Then they'd get married. No pregnancy, he could stay with her if he loved her, but it would be frowned upon knowing that a virile man could have children and still stay with her. I mean, no real downside if he leaves the girl because you'll inevitably find someone who doesn't want kids to sweep you off your feet. And the two of you can have a dual income household filled with cats living the ancient Egyptian dream. So a traditional and ancient method of healing and fertility has been a pilgrimage to a shrine where the journey as well as the offering of prayers, petitions, or in some cases following a prescribed ritual ideally will bestow or heal a woman's fertility. Through divine intervention, if a woman could not cure this, it was believed she was broken, unlikely to wed, and potentially may have spited the gods and thus should be avoided. And if it's not fertility, then your issue may require number three, which is reigniting passion. If a husband's enthusiasm for his wife had dwindled or he found himself struck with the wandering eye, he would be heavily advised to seek medical help. You hear that? You guys hear? I'll hear that. You heard it? If you're pouting that your wife isn't as hot as the other girlies, don't cheat. Go to a doctor and have them smack you upside the head. Or more accurately, give you a unique medicine elixir, which you'd give to her. Remember, it's the blame game after all. If he's not attracted to you now, suddenly it's your fault, not his. Thank God it's only the most puke-inspiring concoction imaginable, made up of dandruff from the scalp of a killed person, blood from a black dog's tick, a drop of your husband's blood from his left ring finger, and his uh, man juice. No specification if it still had to be fresh or if he had to bring it to the doctor in a little cup. If the wife drank this elixir, it was said the husband should fall back in love. Pretty sure she had to love him a lot to drink that nasty crap and not just get one of those quickie ancient Egypt divorces. If the problem was he couldn't get it up, well, there's a 90% less disgusting hack for that that the doctors would hand over. A mix of powder to chia seeds and honey that he should rub all over down there. Doesn't work, next option is foam from a stallion's mouth, so that first option better work. Number two, they're professional drama queens. Death and birth were big deals in ancient Egypt. If families could afford it, they'd get real elaborate with funerals. Hell, if someone was getting sick, it was tradition for everybody to start putting money aside, which is kind of evil if you think about it, but it would make everyone very comfortable with the concept of death to have it thrown at you this way. So I mean, whatever works. Individuals would be carefully mummified by professional embalmers. The body was often decked out in ambulance and jewelry installed in a fine sarcophagus before being interned in a tomb. High class people might even have mortuary temples where priests would offer prayers and goods to sustain the dead person's soul. And some lady you've never seen before who throws herself on the sarcophagus, screaming her damn lungs out while everyone pretends she isn't there and nothing weird is going on. According to the funerary art of ancient Egypt, one of the most striking traditions is that of a professional mourner. These women were paid to act out extravagant grief. In some paintings, they appear weeping and disheveled while touching the deceased's coffin dramatically. Some stories depict them rolling on the ground. Sometimes if a real rich dude died, ladies showed up topless and beset an Anubis mask. Crap could get real crazy. I'd say it wasn't a messed up thing that happened to the ladies, but it definitely was one of the messed up things they did. Don't get it twisted though. I definitely want a professional mourner at my funeral. Last but not least, number one is buried alive. Ah, life of a concubine. As mentioned, crap ain't glamorous physically, but it's at least mentally stimulating. You know what isn't? Being buried alive in a tomb and having to wait out your demise or from starvation or hunger or a deadly snake bite. Who knows? This was very real reality of the concubines and servants until the ancient Egyptians realized maybe it wasn't functional to dispose of an entirely highly trained staff of the previous emperor when they can dutifully serve the next one. So why did the early pharaohs do this? Flaunt some power. Feel a god complex. The belief was that what belonged to the pharaoh on earth also belonged to him in the afterlife. This didn't include material possessions, but people too, like servants and his concubines. This belief enabled the pharaoh to enjoy the same lifestyle in the underworld as he did in the living world. It just meant burying some people alive. The earliest cases date from the late Egyptian prehistory in the reign of Nakata II when e Egyptologists discovered decapitated bodies found in several cemeteries. King Dejet's tomb had 318 sacrifices with him, but altogether the estimates appear to be much higher, with a possible 580, 20% of which are women. Why did the practice of the retainer sacrifices stop after the first dynasty? There's no easy answer. As said, it's illogical to dispose of people that way, especially artisans and women that they needed. So they brought in the cute little Shapti dolls to take that role, and these ladies and servants alike got to continue breathing breaths of fresh air. Alrighty, thank you, thank you so much for tuning in, and I sure hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us, and until next time, what do you think life would be like for you as a lady in ancient Egypt?